So we can tell you about it. Now by Excel University. The most popular fellow at Warby University. University College of Land in Kathar awarded by the senior physical fellowship in 2018. University of Glasgow awarded by the visiting research fellowship. Currently, he is working as a head and assistant professor at the Department of History, SA Kamaya in Kodesh University of Mumbai. They can be invited or shut up a story to the gentleman. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, uh, the Excellency Ambassador Amitabhi, Sweet uh, Family, Women Kiracha, and Kuru uh, Kiracha. Thank you all uh, who have uh, uh, come here to listen to me. Um, there are different changes. So, divided into different parts because uh, it's quite uh, long, long enough to talk on uh, the settlements and entrepreneurship. And uh, the ideas I want to convey as much as possible. So um, the uh, the region in which where there are these lines to talk um, would be uh, more focused on 
focus on the uh, entrepreneurship part. Uh, second line, of course, I am uh, kind of uh, touching the pot. Um, to start with, this the heterogeneous group of merchants, mainly Padyas, Moras, Kojas, Neymans, Lohanas, follow homogeneous business practices. And uh, this is where exactly my planning to is on to argue for the idea of Asian age of capitalism, which is not much uh, kind of uh, interwoven in the historiographical records that we saw today. So, in today's presentation, you will get various glimpses of it and then the bigger picture around the idea of capitalism. Where, uh, we can situate with nodes of entrepreneurship, especially master, family, and home value. Okay, so accordingly, as we move on, so uh, to focus more on the idea of entrepreneurship, I would have uh, selected for the idea of timeline of uh, crossing the Indian Ocean, and we have uh, these hacky works on it, which are not much consulted uh, as because of uh, the archival sources have been consulted by the historians on a larger way. So we have written the works of Yashri Dharam's Tampat, the ancient of the Bhagya, and of course belong to um, Kukhsan group. Acharya, who ended up writing around 30 historical uh, maritime novels, and of course, uh, you can call them historical fiction. And for, if you read their work and the kind of connections which they develop around Arabia and Africa, they tell us that by around 17th century, you see Khojas and Bhatias from Kachya and Kachya are frequently voyage to Arabian and African coast. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, before that those centuries were silent, but since focus is right now on this early modern period, let's talk about their frequent voyages uh, which transform the Indian Ocean into the Indian Lake and to quote Gurman Chai Chai, how long do you or those who are quite acquainted with the idea of Gulf of Kutch, which divides uh, into north home south, north is Kutch, and south is Sakyawar. So in Sakyawar, there is a strip called Halar, where which is, uh, which is interconnecting uh, the ports of Jamnagar, Sikka, and even you talk about the other ports uh, like Chukha, Dwarka. So that's the Halar Strait, right? And we uh, these uh, merchants, uh, Pata merchants, especially Hala and Bhatia merchants, from that particular uh, tip of the, uh, the Gulf of Kutch also travels frequently uh, in this voyage uh, and across the uh, Indian Ocean. And uh, that's why he contains this idea of British way. It's because uh, politically speaking, we have always moved on with this idea of. Uh, how the empires and the empire builders changed the uh, idea of the ocean. But uh, we little focus on Indian Ocean navigational, uh, all navigational networks and routes which were created by the oceanic, uh, uh, or we can say across the ocean connections of the traders and merchants. So Indian Ocean once was freely navigated as the uh, works are suggesting became very contested with European naval claims because in the back of it, there were three empires which were receiving in March in Mughals of India, the uh, Persians, the Safavids of Persia, and Ottomans of Turkey. So all these empires were receiving in margin and you see the ascendance of the Europeans, and my idea was never talked about that for political, for political order and just to make you aware about it. Which corporations remain quite progress, energetic, fluid, despite this changing political order. So it's fair we have to draw a bigger picture to situate this idea of entrepreneurship, which was always with, 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 with odds or without odds, continued 
focused on interlocking uh, uh, circularities and more on commercial collaborations among Manvi, Masjid, and Mumbai, which highlights the idea of vibrancy of play and playing relations. Um, this is the Nancy picture which I was talking about. Um, the royal patrons or the rows of Kutch, you know, the game changers here, because they were the ones who took deep interest in the idea of continual entrepreneurship. And uh, say, for example, we will get this uh, idea of uh, how the royal patrons emerge. Okay, so we have Rao Kengarji, who built the Mindy Port, about which we are right now focused. And uh, around uh, 1581, circa 1581, he was supposed to build this uh, Mindy Port. And then, of uh, course, Rao Bhanuji negotiated the idea of financial economy from the Mughal. And uh, that's how gold became the currency of cash. And uh, in uh, of reciprocity, he opened the pilgrimage route for the Mecca, the Mandi Mecca. Mecca, this of course played a very important role in protecting the trading networks and rules because those were in trade fees, and there was this idea of violence on which I'm researching currently that is called piracy and trade in the Gulf of Kutch. So that was again a border issue. And um, he planted Kachi Gurd in um, Simlaj School in Okamandir. So this is where Desarji played, of course, and he protected many other groups also. Then you had Ram Lakshaji, and he came up with this idea of shipbuilding, um, promoting art, culture, consumption culture. This is all empowering the idea of trade and culture. And then, of course, Rao Gorji, he also was uh, one of those who came up with this idea of uh, uh, promoting shipbuilding. So these are the rulers of the uh, Kutch who played a predominant role, and uh, they are the Rao's. And you can see in uh, the uh, you know, timeline on in this picture. Um, so, Sinsi and Lakwach, they were the one who uh, brought a sea change in the 18th century dynamics, right? I mean, they are more history dominant, and that's why I focus more on them. But uh, let's come to our uh, main uh, Manfi port, uh, which is because of course the premier port of Kutch. Manfi rose as a pivotal um, port as Surat declined. Surat by now was Bandar in Mubarak and was gateway to Hindustan. And uh, of course, because of Surat's uh, voluminous trade relation, we, uh, you know, most of the historic, historiographical accounts are not focused on Manvi. So, how Manvi went unnoticed is what I'm going to show you people. So, Manvi's advantages were many. It had a great hinterland connectivity with Pal, Marwa, where, you know, the textile trade networks were developed. And they have a person with, with, with uh, uh, such hundreds shared not only the border, the boundary, but also trade relations. And then JFL Mail and, of course, access to Malabar Coast and the Red Sea, the Hitler East Africa, Mozambique, and also including Southeast Asia, which I have not mentioned here because I'm more focused on the Western Indian Ocean. This quite but for three, you know, we were around Mumbai and the Mahakal. So in fourth time, we will get to know what I'm trying to say about Mumbai. Because uh, Mahakal uh, was a node of commodity exchange and it developed that diverse trading commodities, commodities sourced from regional, intercoastal, internet networks were circulated in Oka, Muscat and Mandi, uh, sorry, Muscat and Mumbai. And this must not, uh, of course, line uh, involved being in item consumption and manufacturing requirements. And over here, uh, uh, we have to focus on the idea about how this uh, interlock, 
interlocked networks developed between Mumbai, Manvi, and Muscat. And this is where I picked up the title of the lecture also, because Mumbai from was uh, because of India's West uh, foreign trade groups, right? And here Mumbai required a trading partner or a feeder for even Surat was receiving a margin that does mean that you can lose its networks, right? So my play, but its role went unnoticed. My client focus due to Mumbai's rapid ascent. And this is where you know most of the historians are focused talking about Mumbai more and either and then Surat, how Mumbai came into importance and a lot of us mildly as such. So much also became a prominent in Malaysia and at the same time. So this is the dual rise, right? Just not one rise. One is Mandri, other is Muscat. And the same, if you look at the time, look at the time you and the time on the time, think of the place of Surat. Down to what extent. They are reinforcing Mumbai and Mumbai trends are and predominant. Same day is a financial capital from Perth. Yeah. So you can understand that how these maritime trading linkages were so so crucial. Then yeah, we have uh, we have to mention about how much that is uh emotion in at perception uh, and in Zanzibar, of course, Zanzibar is not much focused today, but uh, uh, Matsut and Zanzibar missions are also helping this uh, uh, networks to become more stronger. And we have rights of Matsut taking place because of the idea of, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, how we try to see the vital link for the commodity exchange. Oman convoy system. That was the game team. But that you can't really, you know, think uh, how, uh, I mean, you cannot think about the history of 18th and 19th century without talking about how convoy system uh, transporting the annual coffee fee, the Gulf, for, for play to the Gulf, elevated master significance. If we don't focus on that, we don't get an idea of safe routes. Because the, as I have already mentioned to you that how these routes were so uh, difficult to travel upon or avoid, right? And in that particular time, the coffee, which was so well protected, that other things also were like a uh, uh, point to it, people would look for the money converts. You know, those who are not that particular converts system or for that, because they are giving the same, same package. And same package is what is very important at sea, right? And then Sultan Hunt playing a very important role because he refers to a phenomenon and coming to that. And then it's good the trade opportunity which enables the rise of Muscat. And in 1075, of course, without doubt, we see Muscat emerging as transship when. Right, and then Muscat's um, not much who were very influential, dynamic at that time. India against itself for last twenty years, that is five years, to extend trade in the Western Union. So see how those things are merging one after the other to favor the rallies, different different types of rallies, the animals, the networks. Now you have. Uh, as I said, I will talk about Hamad Moore and other sultans of Muscat who follow this idea of political entrepreneurship in such a positive way that Ahmed bin Sultan Ahmed bin said uh, he was a coffee merchant and a sultan also of course the collaborated with Bhatia merchants. He was well supported in uh, finance and the Sultan Hamad bin said reduced taxes. And direct direct Bhakya capital itself. He was the one who uh, enlarged the entire mission to East Africa in around uh, 1785. It, 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 it was his visionary approach, right? And then, of course, uh, Sultan said, 
who enters the entire customs collections to the Bhatias and moved from uh, Matka to Zanzibar. And this is our Matka town, which boasted security on its street. Passing talks about that goods are lying like this on the street and nobody setting. Uh, this is what this kind of affirmation, this kind of uh, show the traders want, right? And then, of course, effective pulling the uh, force, making a significant destination for foreign mercantile settlements. Then, of course, you have uh, this idea of uh, why uh, to select buses. You know, so there is this idea of trans to settlers. Um, opportunities and mobility. Uh, so this is the slide I was to show you. Uh, yeah, so this is where I'm talking about all the sultans, and this is the uh, crossing the Gulf and the Gulf of Kutch, Arabian Gulf idea. And uh, yes, this is the slide more focused on the idea of mobility led to intertwined stories of circumstantial distress and protection. I mean, not all those who left uh, might be uh, left with the idea of fortune making. There were a number of uh, circumstances, uh, drought, famine, uh, not uh, the family system uh, uh, needed better fortunes. So all, of course, uh, resulted and, and of course, political changes also is already to force migration. So there is this uh, 35 Bhatias who are till they dominant in Muscat's uh, politics and uh, trade were replaced by Manti Bhatias in the 18th century. This is where our protagonist enter, right? So engaged in uh, transient, frequent and back and forth. Leader. So uh, at the beginning, the visits were so frequent, they would just come seasonally using the monsoon winds and voyaging and then go. But after that, in um, say, uh, for as the opportunities were rediscovered and re thought on, so that there is this, there is this idea of seasonal settlement comes, and then comes three to four years, extending to three to four years, and then, of course, uh, extending to 15 years or so. As long as their age is permitting them around the uh, Abraham Parsons mentioned about 55 or something. So, contrast uh, for the unfit settlers in this particular idea of transient heritage. You know, so, so Bhatias were more trans, but Kojas uh, were more secular type, and the Earth were followed by Mahimans and then Bhatias. And Luhanas who eventually settled down with their family. So you have uh, uh, idea of their approaches as they go uh, from transient to settler, and then how embrace a cosmopolitan approach. You know, delegating pluralistic space and engaging in uh, trans cultural interaction. But in uh, as and you see in contrast. Both uh, are settled in their movement. So, we do have a different pattern. And then you have Kotias, uh, the Kachi Kotias, and the Bhagavan's, uh, you know, aiming in the settlement idea of Kotias, neighbors, and other individuals who are uh, wanting to settle down in Master. So, Bhagavan and Kotias, of course, completed the primary and both controlled retailing um, and shop. Through mastery of local and foreign merchandise, Kojas attained a significant influence and amassed considerable fortune. So, next one, when you talk about the idea of big business, uh, big business uh, Pachyas, uh, this followed political uh, political entrepreneurship and financial political authority during the ships and conflicts. Uh, so, uh, we have the Portuguese expulsion in which in Ede, Narutam Banya, his instance is men mentioned by Ibn Randi. And then you have civil war time in, in around Sarka 1720, where they managed the war. Uh, Matkat to Isam uh first trading mission was also because of the uh, Bhatia merchants. 
in circa 1785 if i am not wrong the demand said the two were the one sultan they to have custom collection franchises against the political aid in them then of political capital from master to zanzila in all of these transitions which were politically ordained financially uh, also remunerated you know the political authorities uh, during the shifts and the conflicts so uh, this is not uh, so here we have merchandise uh, which was uh, in ownership over uh, estates and ships and uh, trade operations were also specially and stru uh, structured accord according to the ethnographic representation so uh, The point here. Yeah, point there. Yeah. Okay. So ethnographic representation of Khojai was mirrored in the special structure of Tur and Lavati. I'm going to show you some of the slides on it, which are characterized by row or walled and gated community settlements. And Bhatia settlements were characterized by narrow streets, shops, and houses in customary Mangi and Mundra style, displaying their extensive settlement influence. Then, of course, we are, uh, yeah, these are the slides which uh, are more focused on the idea of uh, how do you see that uh, the uh, picture of gated community emerging. And the yeah, quarter was, of course, uh, in east of the town where they have had temples traditionally since the 17th century. They lived in either Al Maljab or Al at Bane quarters, they were also made at Bane quarters because that was the preference. Both of which were located inside the wall, old walls, and Matra they had their shops to uh, transact their uh, businesses. And the uh, houses were built of stone and cement. So the Banyas and the people from Kach monopolized considerable share of the trade occupied the largest and the best. And a narrow row of uh, shops and the Ardela aligned in the narrow uh, street in the heart of Muscat was a transformed phase which resembled the residential settlement of the port town of Mandri. It was like, it looked more like, a, you know, uh, Mandri than uh, uh, Muscat. And uh, this is what they negotiated. They negotiated religiosity, they negotiated identity, geo spatial privacy, customary practices and rituals, mosques, temples, Tur al Tawakia, and um, of course, cow pen, um, that is Doshalas, and Jamal Khana, Mahajan control, Giga Niti also was. Negotiated. This is so so. Imagine in the out from their own legal system where they are in strange lands, they are still able to negotiate legality and look at the sultans. They are giving that legal space to them. You know, this is what is the idea of floral space. And you can also what is the idea of legal floralism. You know, how there are number of systems which are accommodated. There are there is this Arab system also, right? There is this Oman system also, there is this maritime system also, there is this idea of government control equality, and they have margin there, Jamal Khana. So this is where the entire idea should be uh, understood well. And then of course dietary habits. So if the Bhatiyas are Marja, then they are talking about vegetarianism and all that, that also was well respected and well received. At times, of course, Arun would uh, definitely um, have a fun time with the Bhatiya. There is a foreign traveler who's mentioning about, you know, any sort of information about the Bhatiya that, uh, uh, you know, the Bhatiya is different saying, please don't feel that, uh, that fish which you have caught from the uh, lake. So the the Arab would say, okay, give fun. So the Maya would give the money, and uh, Arab would come and say, okay, I'm not going to eat it. Again, he will throw that particular. Uh, he will bring that fish back to another person. 
human. So it is have you know the whole uh, idea of uh, interaction, which is cross sexuality and interaction. But then how the lives would have been their time. So uh, there are philanthropic uh, spaces also, schools also, hospitals, public spaces, Dharmashan, all spaces that is Punjab for, for the uh, cows. Things eventually came in. So, like how it is, you know, in an organic way forming up. This, this kind of exchange needs to be focused more. Then, of course, we have social religious capital so structures and social idea of uh, how they are doing this social spending. So, providing uh, this social spending out of financial capital, right? So, providing food in times of distress, building wells, red service centers, and sponsoring substantial community. Uh, at Diwali time, the great shade regularly made gifts to relatives, dependents, brokers, brandies, and this is again well captured in the Riyalal, in Gurun by Acharya. This stuff is also the same. So, you don't have to actually differentiate what is Master, what is Zanzibar, what is Man. It's all working in the same way when it comes to the idea of religious giving to financial capital, right? Religious. Uh, temples and rest houses also Dharamshala, the idea of Dharamshala and the, um, the, the places where people can, the transient visitors can rest in. So you have this particular uh, so idea of sojourn, yeah, sojourns, uh, Abraham Carson, especially where some people has remained for a year by others chose to inhabit during life, several of them have great fortunes to their surviving families, and they are great economists, cute in their commercial transactions. Though they are esteemed to be honest, so very quiet and inoffensive, are they in their bad manners that they are in the privilege of living in a separate district of town and in the public exercise of their activities? This is what exactly I told you that was already negotiated, right? And then, of course, uh, when it comes to their uh, uh, quarters in the week, uh, yeah, I already covered this slide. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, these are the photos which you would like to see. As I said, Muscat, Manvi, Zanzibar, Mumbai is not it. Here is the picture of Bhatiyar. Of Mumbai, you can see India's uh, dresses and the kind of glimpses uh, it gives you of the age to which they belong and the kind of uh, identity through their dressing they negotiated. This, these ideas are such such fascinating one. It should be highlighted and also documented. Uh, we have Lohana's. Pakyas uh, and Rohanas both uh, boast the origin of the Chakriyas. So, uh, Rohanas in the same place, Mumbai. Then, of course, we have Khojas to talk about more. Khojas were, of course, shopkeepers, as I have already told you. And then carpenters, shipbuilders, they also traded in textiles. So, uh, but Rare talks about them at length in his work. And yeah, tender prize as a very uh, labyrinth uh, of uh, fish, uh, meat with grain, vegetable sellers, and shoemakers, cutlers, and hardware sellers, and the shop of beads and ornaments. Uh, there is an entire work by uh, Sultan Somji called Bead Bike in East Africa. And this is again for. Uh, to about mustard kojas also. So uh, in in building for beads, koja females actually help their uh, partners, and uh, koja community of course uh, had a tradition uh, in uh, in which it is depicted in the first as they 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 were the first group which arrived from Kutch or Thin, and some uh, three or four hundred years ago. So this is where you know Kojas also possess a long historicity as far as their mobility was concerned. Um, Ibn, uh, because uh, uh, 
Razak's uh, marks are the uh, connection with Oman and the 1740s. British records also talk about them in 1780s. So 1740s, between 1740s and 1780s, you can situate them in Muscat. And then, of course, Kodak also have their uh, distinguished places, as I have already discussed about. Um, this is how it looks like. Yeah. So we have Kojas of 19th century Mumbai. You have Raymond also. They again have their traditional dress code. You have Bora also. Bora much focus as far as Muscat is concerned because uh, their uh, numbers are great in East Africa and Mozambique more. So, yeah, we don't get much idea about the uh, I would like to know if there is something you all can help me with. Uh, but uh, in my research, uh, we haven't featured much. Um, as far as the uh, Indian traders are concerned and their struggles are concerned, in 20th century also it continues. So, we have adverse climatic conditions, nighttime transportation. Uh, Using, uh, uh, you know, uh, using of pensions due to uh, limited visibility, closing gates of city during the night for security methods to combat heat, their customer eating practices, usage of wealth. All this I had uh, written with Ms. Bhatia in uh, 2018. At that time, they had told me. I'm going to document more on it, but let's move on quickly to the second part of the talk, which talks about mercantile default and the argument of the picture. Uh, traders and merchants' well structured operations provided them with deserving advantage in the mercantile world. And of course, uh, the traditional practices and business patterns. Uh, fostered reciprocal entrepreneurial relationship despite you know I don't stop it because if you don't understand this what we are passing down in history also would remain the same here I think those who are present here please take a note of it that despite you know the road we have played you know, it was effectively effective, it was profitable. They operated alongside Euro American firms, but their portrayal in history was like untrustworthy, untrustless. Like how these notions have changed. I'm not saying that there is no uh, there is no gray element in that. There are dark signs. I'm not even trying to romanticize the idea of uh, trading history and traders and masters and all that. No glorification, right? But then there are like brighter sides. If there are darker sides, there are brighter sides. If we are documenting darker sides, why can't we document the brighter sides? I'm getting my point. Why? Because, you know, when I teach my students the history of Maharashtra, for example, I uh, there, in Kalki Times, I'm talking about textbook, talks about how these persons have been exploited, money lending, and you know, uh, how peasantry and tribal rewards happen because of that. I'm not saying it's not, right? That's just one part of the land. Where is this other side of the land? I mean, if we are not having balanced narratives, aren't we feeding the silence? I think we are responsible for those historical gaps. How far, you know, today, in today's time, and I also have unfortunately teach the same whatever comes down in the text. Why? Because students won't score them. If I tell them to write differently, the teachers won't score them, right? So what happens is that the same stereotype and these gaps are left. So my my question to everyone is that when are we going to have current narratives, balanced narratives, and how long will it take to reach to the 
layman or uh, public domain because it should not remain in ivory tower. It should not just talk about, you know, I okay, armchair, scholarship, and such. Let's talk about color kind of narrative. Even the bizarre showing, even the wild showing, show me the show. I think that color. And that is when, you know, I think how I'm proving this point, right? So, the, look at this. It's very important that I, if I don't have to move from here, yeah, I am fine. I, if I show them with this side, I'm fine. But I have carry this very strongly to the audience that Marx and Jamaat community dialects. Commercial work. You're talking about untrustworthy. Commercial leaders have to be acknowledged and honored in any circumstance. Who is controlling this? You know, these are all invisible controls, but these are all so effective in nature, right? Community norms, conventional code, cohesive code, social testing, ready for the land. These are all so intricately related that we can't really. Uh, sense it in our understanding and writing because we are not looking at the idea of how the capital is living, how commercial deals are living, five times and all. And when something called technologies of trust, trust, and then the right is an untrustful. I mean, look at the contrast, look at the paradox. Which is being created, right? And then Dharma, the idea of Dharma. Huh? And until then, we all know how identities have been revolving around the idea of religion, right? And then shape. What the, the, the name of shape is just not shape because if money is wealthy, is living in a better house than others. No. That itself carries loaded responsibility and accountability. What is leading the accumulation of their was also part of those days of eating, right? Their patronage to relatives and community fellows. Pancho Gram, Pancho Gram Chowa. He's ours, he's our brother, he's from our village. Let's, let's give him the hand, help him kindly. These are the ways which we can see the narratives, right? And uh, one more thing, you can you can skip this also. The Pali Mahajan and Council of Merchants, the occupational Mahajans were often critical arenas in which authority was generated and perpetuated. Membership in most occupational Mahajans crossed the lines of communities. Then you have secure commercial interests of traders, right? So everyone was well protected by the idea of legality coming from Smartana or coming from Mahajan. And then there is large Nepali Mahajan which is transcending countries of caste, community, religion. This is Nepali Mahajan, which is much, much above that world, the other Mahajan and the Mahajanas. Right? So you have uh, credit was available within this community. This was effective means of regulation and control. Formulation, formulating then the enforcement code of behavior, custodian of reputation, occupational mahajan exists in most of the prestigious lines of commerce. Yes, then if you move on with this idea, uh, you have enforced standards of business practices. Checking on the violations which find then even expulsion. Get steady pressure on its members to uphold their business agreements. Offer financial help to members who had fallen into debt. Honorable bankruptcy. We are there to help you. This honorable bankruptcy, Tata Gupta. So, main exploitation. Right? Because you have cheated upon, you have been upon, you can be able to. Has been left up, right? So the guild also settled trade disputes. Then you have Mahajans tried to 
protect the economy of drugs, which collected a tax for Lago. You must be knowing about those who are those who are giving the annual Lago, right? This Lago is so important. I never understood when I go to my community, okay, I've been that fellow gave so much of so Lago, I had to Lago, I had to Lago. What is Lago, Lago, Lago? Never understood the idea of Lago, but now that I research and then I understand my processes of understanding and scholarship, I can understand the claims of their members and the proceeds are how it uh, judiciously used. You know, it's better to use this word. Because religious shrines to looking after each member is what is happening to the Lago. Right? So, yeah, this is what I spoke just now. And then uh, there are commercial networking um, is very important to understand because uh, these were also business information portals. You don't have Instagram, you don't have all the internet, uh, social media connectivity, you do not have any of the uh, online facilities. Right now we are having two different gadgets. Here is the Mahajan Jamal Khana here in that remind. Negotiate trading ventures. These are simple community gadgets. For them, the mass council function as a historian of their death. It was progress, it was having a progressive economic role, right? So now let's come to the second very interesting part: bankless banks and models of invisible debt. How financial flows were encapsulated, right? So in a long distance trade, and again, I didn't long distance trade, these were often imperative attributes on which the risk appetite and the need to these great agents who were connected with banking monasteries of Mandri um, shaped the bankless banking business model with master. Huh. So rolling long term credit was their favorite. American model would say, you know, Richard Water, uh, Water Safer that went in Salem, Massachusetts. We, no, 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 no credit, only cash. And that's immediate, and no advance payment, just a payment at the time of day. That's it. This is their pattern of it. I'm not saying it is not effective because American is also dominated as uh, uh, one of the trajectories of uh, uh, trade and entrepreneurship. But at the same time, why Indians were much for that? Because they were giving this credit, uh, ready credit available for some of the risky businesses, like um, I can say. So buying funds, for buying funds, that finance would come from Mumbai. And money market, uh, Mumbai money market would uh, easily do the credit transfer, uh, which is accumulated or sold well in the form of money, jewels, or other things. And this is where you can see the comparatively Richard Waters paper stock different, right? And uh, of course, the risk appetite of the Indian model and the American model was different in their approaches. What is But who was taking more risk? That is that, right? So we see the Americans would follow the network of the Indian company. Finally, they are what Indians are saying. Why? Because you are banking on them for the long distance circularity of finance with their capital, especially Mumbai. You, you don't you have no other choice, right? So in part of the idea of trading, um uh, trading uh networks within pregnant, that is the steepos. I'm talking about that ecosystem. Because uh, that ecosystem is very important. Here, I argue that in connecting the unconnected, the end graph capital and uh, its circulation within the underlying trading processes was a chief power play factors. So we have to know how the commercial uh, commerciality of the ecosystem developed. Seeking local trading partners, establishing connections and partnerships, complex capital flow, 
and sediment in landscapes, but collective material culture. This collective culture resulted widespread circularity in commodity trade, credit system, and capital flows. Um, and then why it became a force? Because of the meaning of pearl, textile, ivory, dates, and beyond. What see is that they are all interlocked in their network connectivity with monastery and the other systems of finances. Right, so this becomes a major silence and remains unnoticed till the time we get hold over some of the exclusive documents. And these exclusive documents are monastery records of the post office, to which I mean, to that community to which I belong, and here you can see the same day records. So, so very untapped till day. Why? Because the Goswami monasteries, it was 14 numbers in Mantri, and the chief one was the Nyangar, Nirmalgar, Goswami Mat. They won't give access to anyone who is from outside. And fortunately, I am a Goswami, I got the access. So, if you want those records, you tell me, I will take you down to those records, and these records are. Such wonderful records. If you get access of this record, the entire idea of uh, financial uh, exchange or bills of exchange appears, which appears to be very soft, long. We 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 start to think, this is a small piece of paper. How it must be okay? But it was so effective that uh, in circulation, it was not even in case of insolvency. And even after the death of the mother. So the son has to, you know, honor it. And if son is not honoring, of course, he may not have a place in the market. Right? So imagine how these movies were so effective and movies were issued by monasteries. Okay? This was banking come religious house of uh, uh, getting into the uh, flow of capital. And ensure the secure transactions, that's I call them, which were very effective in Sarika also and in Mustard. And in Manu, the mass schedule of the monastery records the entries. So we have uh, more pictures of it. Uh, if, she, if you can read one Gujarati, the, these are the records which are talking about how this master legend was kept. And in that, all the degrees of Hundis were um, documented. And uh, in uh, Central Africa, uh, Central and East Africa, I circulated along the Western Indian coast, reaching the mountains surrounding two regions like Paruti, Marwa, Nalchutana. These invisible networks were operative and this this was the effective mechanism. So relatively obscure market exhibited similar to fact bustling bazaar imam and these uh, regions facilitated Malvi's textile trade in Arabia, which gave Mumbai the uh, predominant control over the textile circulation and textile capital, which uh, was later on Japan contested. So these are all emerging larger, larger pictures out of this. More pictures on this. This is about how, you know, they wrote letters about how their uh, mass system or monastery system was working. And uh, they are also talking about the resolution on cutting the ivory and other things, so manufacturing and all. Uh, more records are here. All of these are the signatures of the Mathadis who were part of this system. Um, and come to the protect this. You must see him uh, to understand. Look at the way he's sitting. Look at the idea of monastery as a sarkar. Mere mention of the word sarkar talks about government is quite conspicuous. And as it refers to the mahant of the uh, chief monastery, it talks about oral information about uh, how 
uh, giri, uh, pran giri occupied a prominent position near the Rao throne and provided cards filled with money, that is coal, whenever needed, cards and cards. My father doctor told me this, that whenever Rao would need money, this Rid Giri, the Sarkar, would send cards from Manvi to Bhuj. So you can imagine cards and cards from Manvi to Bhuj. It's one and, uh, one and a half hours distance by vehicle we go. So that law and that particular itself gave the idea of how much ever it is a legend. The records of Kundi transactions which are not accessible to the outsider attest the fact that it was the monastery which circulated capital and financial to Jairam Shivji, to Thalia Tope, all the entries I told you the previous record in which they have names are they have read them. I've read them, I've, I've learned uh, old Gujarati, uh, it's called Moni Street, but then it takes time to read up to them slow later. But then that gave me a considerable idea. Then of course you have uh, other archival records to support this idea and that is Revagar who was the Goswami from Manvi who had a branch business in Mumbai and Matsar. And, and in the British records his name is there. So he traded in various Indian and foreign goods on significant property in Matsar and Revagar also had established himself in the Darbar of Dutch like uh, Rizgurj. And then, of course, another trade of, um, uh, trader from the same class, Dollar Girl Manjuk Giri, created his agents in Master. Then, Manji also was based in Master. So, these are the Goswamis. And now, let's come to the very important part of commodity trade, which is talking about coffee trade, Master, Manji, uh, Master, how they are changing, changing the dynamics of trade. Because Master Tentry in Mukal's coffee trade, Transform the trading equations in favor of master money and invite and increase the importance of low cost shipping services. Obviously, curb the British. British were really frustrated with the way Omanis were taking over, and the Indians were more happy with the growing prospect uh, of trade and shipping in master. Right? So, these uh, attracted many Kachis to settle down here. Um, I don't spend much time here because I'm not many people of yours have uh, pictures of mercantile activities where they talk about how this coffee was in circulation um, uh, from Matra to Matra and in the rest of the world. And it was uh, reformed the most, more than half in Matra and the work of those into Bahrain were received through Matra. So at Matkar, the liquidity coffee trade was in the hands of Manvi Danyas. And at Moka, too, the greatest part of the foreign trade was uh, uh, transacted by the Banyas. So Parson, of course, talks about uh, how they wear particular dress of white calico and they were 200 and above. So uh, the, how they manage this particular trade is very important. Here is the idea of resourcefulness, being resourceful. You are buying for, by in Britain, or the cargoes are filled when you are uh, voyaging from Manji, embarking point, point of the port. You have Manji, you have area, you have Bagos, you have Tanskan Shikha, some of the meaning, even I have to ask people who know about this. Imported yearly into Manvi from elsewhere and sold in Moka and uh, Master also. And from Moka and Master, the retail cargoes were laden with gold, pearls, coffee, dried fruit. So, this is what is the idea of extra, extra something. I mean, we wouldn't have heard about those commodities, but they would just pack it. Might as well sell it in the market. Might as well sell it in the market. So, this is where. The entire uh, circulation idea will be understood over, around coffee. And then, how Surat margin lines and Mumbai took over. So, uh, Manji Mumbai, Gulli and France were facilitated the transaction. And the Rao of Kutch uh, led with the 
uh, taxes on it, two and a half crores. So Rao's taxes on coffee kept Manji financially autonomous. Otherwise, Mumbai wouldn't, wouldn't have allowed Manji to share much. And then, of course, VOC, the Dutch were very frustrated with this kind of monopoly. So they would attack. And then, of course, they are about good call the Indian traders or uh, other traders' fights. What about they themselves into three day three day activities, right? So this is again um, uh, very important. We're talking about trans regional resourcefulness of money. And uh, yeah, I mean uh, how it worked is very important because branch business emerged as a successful trade method. And Mustard traders established forms or agents at Arabian ports. Uh, Arabian Gulf traders engaged directly with while others conducted trade to Basra. Banyas uh, Basra functioned as independent uh, brokers or agents with some having uh, direct connections to merchants in Mandi and Mumbai, and others trading via Basra based Banyas. So this is how you know complexity of networks one can understand and how they were interlocking intersecting with each other and different different time and different patterns uh quickly let's come to very interesting part of it that is called of the arabian girls uh, girls and the indian finance so the 18th and 19th centuries uh, saw prosperous for fisheries Hattal bhatia from sind and kachi bhatia from muscat was the key player in the market the industry heavily relied on credit extended by Banyas to call divers and aiding them during the non dairy season. So, what kind of a role they played, I will quickly show you, and you can understand from this slide here. So, you have uh, uh, it was an activity, and the Banyas or the Banyas have uh, they were the one who was supplying food and uh, other. Requirements, finance, the polling operations, supply dates, rice, tobacco for the trip, right? And then, of course, get accounts in their ledger, settle in debts using the uh, proceeds of the sales of pearls. In case of bad season, debt was carried forward. So, uh, this is how the entire uh, pearl trading uh, operations were carried forward. And then, of course, towards the end of the grid, brought the process. So, Banya was also settled in places like Sharjah, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, and Qatar, as well as also. So, number of possibilities from the poetry were explored. Risk and extortion were also part of this. So the pearl trade benefited the Banyas, but given that it was built on the edifice of death, default was a risk. Okay. And uh, yeah, so the default was a risk, absconding divers or migration of debtors, extortion of political users, all of these were part of this particular pearl trade. And uh, how it was transported. That is very important. British India, steam navigation and Bombay Bazaar. Uh, collaborated in this particular uh, deal, and then uh, Mustard's pearl dealers shipped from Bahrain to Mumbai via BIS and British Indian Steam Navigation main steamer. Then, of course, you have Kachi and Sindhi dealers imported significant uh, amount of dollars and rupees from paper. So, you have some pictures here of. Uh, how um, Mumbai emerged with pearl capital, mustard and mangi merchants, and how Kachi Ganyas alongside Sindhi Ganyas. So you have even uh, syndicate to drink This is very important. Syndicate is monopolizing the pearl trading activities. So now Makanji, Kachi Bhatia, from Mumbai, manage various cotton mills. You must have heard about Khatao. You know, then he and Govardhan Khatao, uh, his uh, successor, actively pursued the whole business both individually through a syndicate formed in 1908 and his syndicate uh, with commission agents in London and Paris 
the gold in 1910 and single handedly overcame the Tao to control of it in 1968. Scottish firm and conservative Scottish records also. And these Scottish records are saying that how Finlay and Hannibal they offer collaboration in partnership. And at this time, Japan also enters this ring. So we have a number of players emerging out of this and the uh, complexity is emerging because merchants utilize their capital for textile exports and foreign imports, showcasing robust and complex nature of their enterprises. Um, quickly, uh, let's see the statistics around it. The statistics are telling you that how Mumbai imported pearls of 20 lakhs in 1884-85 and uh, in 1899, there is a joint in this network which would share the pearl trade and unsaid pearls counted 54 lakhs of this price. Consequently, Halibut Simon from um, sorry, Simmons from uh, uh, London and James Finlay from Scotland also negotiated with Bombay pearl traders. Uh, Quickly, let's go to example of who flourished out of this. All of these flourished. The Bajas, the Jains, the Parsis, the Kojas, the Moras, the Minimans, all of them flourished out of this particular trade. All were involved. That's why Bombay emerged as a pearl capital. It's just not mustard based Bhatias or Sindhi. Martias or Kojas. Here you have a number of others who are involved in this particular line. And you have tales of Jamshed GDG boy, if you have heard about this uh, business uh, baronet who was the uh, Parsi dealer, played a key role in establishing Mumbai as a uh, re exporting center. And he uh, traded to Calcutta, China, and Vela. Vela is Vilayo. And the largest means Southeast Asia for the traders of Mumbai, right? So, how you can see how pearl trade um, circulation is uh, just expanding beyond the Western Indian Ocean, going over to the Eastern Indian Ocean, right? Where the Jamshed GDP boy he had three trips, all the trips failed. Fourth trip. It was about to be shipwrecked situation. At that time, his manager, Parman, they smartly had pocketed, uh, and he had kept that uh, pearl from a pearl. You don't require sort of safe and uh, the safe to the ship. You need just uh, parcel to be kept safely in safe deposit or something. So he just uh, kept it in his pocket, and uh, because of that particular small packet. His entire voyage became so successful that you are jumps a GDP boy emerging as a business magnet of Mumbai. And of course, British collaborated with him later on. And uh, you have another uh, Srimad Raj Chandra. He had a cult following. He's a Jain, um, he's a Jain spiritual leader uh, who was uh, having his younger brother made. He, I mean, also oh, he was a reward figure among the Jains and cult following, and he was also in this particular narrative of honesty where two other brothers had gone and sold the packet of pearl to um, Riva Shankar Jeevan uh, company, where she was at the London, and uh, which is continued by Kinji Ramdas in present day Master or Kill Day. So what started, what was started by the money is continued today. You have next in line Shivji Topin. And he started with master, then uh, so shifted his ways to um, uh, Zanzibar. But both Vatsanuji had Dimani and Shivji Topin uh, accompanied Sultan of Master in his expedition to East Africa to re uh, assert the Omani influence. The custom selections during the time was decentralized and decentralized. This is where the revolutionary change was affected in systematizing the fiscal affairs. Uh, you have Jairam Shivji, uh, who was uh, there for quite a long time, Merchant Prince. He was his firm uh, monopolized business buildings along the coast. Custom collectors at the port were 
predominantly Indian, leading the idea of fourth Indian or Banyan Sota. So this is where the entire uh, uh, command over the financial operation can be understood. Um, you have partnership with Richard Waters and Jagan Shivji, where uh, they are connecting Muscat, Mumbai, and Zanzibar also because the New England merchants and the British merchants like uh, Robert Nosworthy uh, were, uh, you know, uh, so earthed by this particular idea that they are collaborating. But uh, despite all of the opposition they collaborated with, and that's why Robert Nosworthy displayed the, the particular ban uh, outside his house, no monopoly, no monopoly. But then there was there was no takers because Zeram should be on the force, and no one, no, nobody should challenge that. So this is where we have, well, now we have legendary Sheikh Rasan Sheikh Bin Kushotam Al Baniyani, and the title is suggesting that how dominating the entire uh, control had become of the Bhatiyas by the time the Rishi Kushotam came to um, uh, take over the seat of an affluent uh, entrepreneur. He, uh, of course, uh, operated as a portfolio entrepreneur alongside the Manis and Jairam Shivji as a Bhatia from Manvi born in 1843, entered quite late, of course, according to his timeline. He arrived in Muscat in 1857, but by the time 19th century got over, his firm was engaged in profitable trade dealing in grain, textile, and aids, and his expanding business attracted attention of William Hill Jr., a prominent from a trader from New York, and who approached him for a study for days. So you have uh, yeah, so this particular slide I will play. And he had esteemed both of Custom Masters also due to his strong financial standing. Um he then Empire occupied a prominent location within market quality at Bay Ratansi, a remarkable office residential complex near the palace. And that itself tells you how empowering the entire business enterprise was. Ratansi earned the title of the King Baksha of the Mustard Trading World. He had a uh, in success and influence. Because uh, there are a number of other uh, ideas related to this particular case study I have written it in my second book uh, at length. So, uh, and it takes a lot of time to go through it because the uh, business operations were really uh, quite voluminous in nature. So, it can't or in one particular presentation, from a lab. So, that will be the uh, separate, uh, separate uh, space and uh, time so that. Uh, the uh, entire the idea of this uh, trade partnership and William Hill's uh, correspondence can be brought. Um, yes, I can just show you the glimpses of it, which Vimal uh, Kurechaji kindly shared with me. And because of that particular thing, I could write at length in my second, uh, second book, because the first book I had already covered was on Master and Zanzibar. So I was just wondering what new I can gain to. It was uh, at this time the, the correspondence and the documents which are preserved in the private archives of the you know, we help me. So yeah, thank you for that. But we will just move on quickly to the idea of arms trade also, in which they were uh, in, uh, emerging factor, and it has many other dimensions and perspectives as far as global arms trade was concerned, which also are covered. But this is the time we have to. Uh, four pillars of uh, revival, you can see in 1860 onwards, Dolph Giri, Manu Giri, Ratan Virji Pushotam, Damodar Dharam Shri, all of them were given the title, different different titles, like Dolph Giri, Manu Giri, Ekka, then Ratan Pushotam, Baksha, Virji Pushotam Rani and Dhamudar Dharam Shri and Jack of Hockey. So this is how uh, the entire site, but some of the IT builders in Sanskrit uh, uh, like Harya Gopal, Adhvila, Nishan, uh, Shiva, Hadi Bhavis, they were given the title of Ayurveda. So those titles are also coming. 
you have more hands joining uh, in this particular uh, work that particular slide is here because I actually this is not the slide that I'm getting practice in this way because I updated the thing that was wrong in the project. So I have the names I call up to name for some programming, this running, Dharam Sinensi, Pushotam Tanji, Shan Agadas Manji, uh, Manji, uh, Madhu Jivenji, Ram, uh, Ramnik Lal Kothari, Pushotam Damodar, Pushotam Madhuji, Lakshmi Dar, Ved, Narendra Mirji, and other things. So, yeah, we have 20th century of the Kenji Ramdas, which is how I felt like giving the title. Because since 1870s, uh, pretty much and it's quarter, dates, dry, lines, and sentences, and then importer of grain, peas, and spices, and then of course, industrialist, capitalist, business conglomerate was developed in diverse entrepreneurship, consumer goods, infrastructure, industrial entrepreneurship, partnership of 400 global slums, and so on. So, you know, so we have uh, one uh, narrative of Gokal Das Kimji bridging the political pregnancy. How to study? This, this slide is just not about talking about what Kimji Ram does again. All of you know about it very well. But my point is here you know, that they are, uh, they, they became so significant political and economic link between Sultan, Sayyid bin Taimur, and interior leaders that they were bridging the political fragmentation. This is how the documents to be read to make a theoretical argument. Mm -hmm. Served as a government labor contractor for Royal Air Force construction projects during World War II and became the sole government contractor after Oman's uh, reunification and established the major state establishment. This is just a part of it, just a link of it. There are many things. Uh, Kimjis were doing in different ways. So uh, we need a separate and talk on this. Here it is not included here. Believe me, you can come in, we cannot see Kimji, the patriarch, the shape I included. He uh, could uh, has a, a you know, a base um, both in Muscat and Mumbai as he was educated in Mumbai. And he was, uh, of course, uh, related to uh, professional and organizational involvement, actively engaged in English, Indian and Omani uh, institutions, served as their boards, the position of chairman in significant organizations like Hindu Mahajan Association. I talked recently about Mahajan, and you are the example of Kalasi Kenji as uh, the chair of it. The association historically managed Muscat's Indian school. Uh, schools and maintains two Hindu temples in Basra's leadership role and influence also is great. He figures within Oman's Hindu community and also larger Indian community. And then families uh, substantially uh, contribute to the Oman's development over a century and so until day. So recognition of course comes there to Kalamsi Kenji in the title of Shay. This is where you know the entire journey has a logical conclusion and recognition and acknowledgement from the political authority. Um, the legacy also continues again. I have the picture here that I can't show you now because it's not a visible. Yeah, this slide is included by my daughter, my, my daughter saying that mama you have to write this and uh, this is how she initiated this particular slide for the people. I'm not adequate. I also want to talk about capitalism and all that, but I'm sure I ran out of time.
So one day, uh, Sultan Sayyid he called him Mamo. He was like, Mamo, I want to go down to Aden and get me this Rolex. And he was like, what? what? So he wrote it down on a piece of paper where he underlined Rolex and said that I want to get three of these, uh, you know, for my uh, for my son and for my family. So he went down to Aden, got three, got two for his daughter-in-law and stuff. And when he went back, he was like, you know what? You know, uh, I'm interested. Why don't we contact the headquarters and see that it's a how the relationships have grown in country. Uh, and that was just the way his mind worked. That he found opportunity always where it could be taken. Um, again, as time went on, he was able to pay back his debt because of his relationship with the people. He gave a trust to the people. If he didn't have to trust to the people, they would not share what they needed, what they wanted, and what he could do for them. So as he gained the trust, he was able to stay up to death. And one key reason was when the British came in during the front of time, these Allied forces needed a lot of the food, they needed clothing, they needed water, they needed a lot of different resources. And he became a contact to the government in terms of military aid and whatever else they needed. The Americans also came in and they actually went to Dukum. And so from what it is today, the from what it was back then was very different. Um, they said that there was opportunity to find oil. Now, I asked the question, you know, why didn't we go into oil? We were there and we were established. It was too complex. What's the problem? So I'm not sure. I punch my punch my fist every time I think about it, but you know, it's a very long thing like this. Um but we were the first sponsors of Shell in uh, 1970, the big Shell here. And we did operate and run a lot of the Shell uh, petrol stations that first came into the country. So we were part of it. We didn't go too complex into it, uh, but then other stories about it. So as time went on, uh, in came the arrival of Francis Bahal. Of course, he was educated outside in India, in England, within the country. He saw the world develop post World War on how things would be post the World War. So he had a very new mind. And as he had a new mind, there was one key factor for him, which was education. Now, at that time, Mr. Gokodak was 69 years of age. He was also reaching a time where, you know, because of his relationship and how close he was to something, he thought maybe it's best for him to go back. He was offered the citizenship. So Kabul did meet with him to say he was like no, no. So Kabul saw him as an uncle because he was brought up in his arm based on his relationship with my So he was like no, I need to go back. I want to go back to my uh, hometown. I want to go to school. So he was like Aman needs school. Aman needs talk. Aman needs love. So he's like okay, you can go, but I want to do condition. You come in with me every year, and before you go, you build me a school and you build me a house. So, somewhere in uh, Shamla, he went and he built him uh, two classrooms and a little clinic. Um, and then, obviously, came back very often to stay at the same Of course, then came the generation of Amibai, my grandfather, and they took up with it. And for them as well, it was not an easy effort. They were sent to school, they were sent to Salah, they were sent to many different places, and they were trying to learn, so to learn it by themselves, without anybody being there. So these hardships actually taught them more about the business than any other did. Uh, and that was a key element going across. My grand great grandfather also endured it. My father endured it. I'm going through the same thing, which I will get to. Um, but it was something that was key for the progression of why we have lasted 450 years. So during the 70s, uh, Oman progressed, 80s, 90s, Oman progressed. We had our defense related opportunities that we were involved in. Uh, we had Rolex that we were involved in. We would sell t-shirts, for example, Lacos was a brand that we were associated with. Luxury items, other accessories, other items, but they said, okay, why don't you get into building materials? Why don't you start doing construction? Because there's a lot of interest up for you. So we got into construction. We bring down people from us to help us construct many different things. And one of the first things that we started with was 
a little border patrol and a little port, a port in her boot, which was on the border of Yemen. Because of the rebellion or functionality, that's what we have. And we did the same thing based on our, our borders in the UAE and many different islands. Um, there was one thing that was always lacking within the family as we did progress and as we did diversify, and one of that change. And I did mention before that the Grand was very uh, heavily emphasizing on the need for education for everybody, whether it be under a tree, whether for anybody to have to that. And within us, during the time, it, it wasn't looked at upon as something that was necessary. Time went on and the new generation came in. We ourselves were also pushing for you know our generation to get educated, our people that we were involved that they would get educated. So as my father's generation came in, uh, my father came back in 1985 when you know the all price was again all time low. Uh, he did his schooling in Mumbai, went to the went to the Japan, did his boarding school. Went to the UK, did other education, but then couldn't find a job because of the market at the time. Came back to Oman, and luckily for him, he joined uh, the Roman market. Through connections, again, through relationships, he was able to manage to find a job there. Uh, and that for him was the best learning because he got to mingle with the community, which was the local Oman. Um, and that gave him the first stepping stone of progressing through and being able to be part of the community as well as his back. Now, at the time as well, because of the oil prices, um, the construction industry was an all time job. We had 3,000 employees, but 3,000 related to construction. So, his first job when he came in was downsize that construction to only 300 people. But then, you know, he couldn't just sit at home. He didn't want to sit at home. He said, okay, I've done construction engineering and a degree. That's not going to stop me from learning something different. So he went on to learn about the many different things. So how many elements that we didn't get into at the time was SMP talking down with us. Because we were for us. He went away to England with my mother, yeah. you know, would drive down 150 miles every day and learn the hard way to then come back to Burman and start and diversify business that way. Because there was no other way of doing it. As time progressed through the 18th and 19th, we diversified into different things. And today, I'm sure you'll see we're known for a spa, we're known for a Rolex, the Samsung High, for all of these. Um, but there are other elements that we do go into that not many may know about. Today, they are employed around 5,000 people. We are into four different clusters. Luxury lifestyle, consumer goods, infrastructure, travel, travel, and shipping. And across those, we have 50 positions and we represent about 500 customers. Now, coming to the transition of the new generation. For me, growing up, was it a choice of mine to join the business or did I want to join the business? I didn't really have a choice, to be honest. Um, but you know, all girls decide. Sitting down at the breakfast table, the lunch table, the dinner table, all that was discussed with work. There was no baby talk. Uh, but that taught me the best way to get introduced to the market, to the business, and how it COVID experience, for example, uh, was a key element for me. I, for example, went to boarding school as well, as did my uh, you know, older generation. But what I was different is that we went to a local school. And that for me was key because I learned that. It was something that was not done before. And it helped me gain the trust of any local that I meet, uh, any person that I mingle with, uh, and build that relationship because that would then help me as where I am today. So as I came into the business, uh, I had a great job in the UK, but it was time to come back, and my mother was pushing. I still remind you today that you are here because of me. Um, but I became very grateful for that because I came in at a very hard time in COVID where, you know, industry got an all-time low. I was inducted into the infrastructure cluster. Um, and we made a vow that we're not going to get rid of anybody. We're not going uh, to go home. We're going to keep the people because in times of tough times, 
we set them to survive. And today, based on that, with the utmost gratefulness that we did not let go of anybody and we stood with God. Some of the areas which we may not know about that we are involved in are, for example, renewable energy. I don't know if any of you know, but the largest operation of solar projects in the country is actually on top of our warehouse for our SMPG building. And it's about one megawatt with factory room two. Uh, when we worked with a local SME company and a local online boy who had the setup. And this was all done because my father decided to get into a car with this local man. They began talking and they realized that there was an area for opportunity. Another element which I know many not know about is marine, our marine industry. We do dredging, we do quantum, we actually built two vessels in the home with Aman dry dock, which are fully aluminium, built solely in Aman. And for the first time, I know that was done. And of course, if we go back, Post the extreme 1800s, I'm sure there are a lot of people who built out, but you know, it's very nice to go back into that industry of building. Waste management, for example, in the north coast of Baden, we actually manage all the waste resources over there. So there are so many different elements that we are involved in and we are diversified in. And that's because we always want an area for a new opportunity to come in. We always want to evolve. And as the country evolves, we'd like to do the same. If I were to sum up why we have to remain different um, and how we have evolved, it's care for our employees, care for our customers, and care for our principles. Even the principles that we had back in 1960s, for example, the Rolex, the General AC, still today they remain with us because of our key relationship that we have with them. The different on our phone. We all talk about the projects that we do, but we have to deliver on what you have said in that fund. The quality, the timeline, no matter the cost burden, no matter the issues of delay, it will always be that the time always reminding us. No matter the cost, you have to deliver on the promise that you've made. And the, Fourth one, which is again the most important for me, was education. Educating your people the right way, educating the people that you deal with, being honest with them. I'm sorry that I don't have any pictures to lend to you, but I'm sure you can imagine as to how we are today. As the Vision 2040 and Hassan Hayden and his progression through the country, it's always been our key, and we let everybody around us know that our key is. What we give back to the country because the country gave us the room to come in and put our business to live over here. It's always on the to back to them. I'd like to keep this short and brief, but my main uh, give back is that, you know, throughout time and throughout what we see in PR go through, throughout the downturns and up, it's the downturns that we've learned so much about. And our only goal is to. Provide service to the country, give back to the country, give back to the community, uh, and be involved. So, trust, care, commitment, and learn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Help me and we invite the Secretary of the Ambassador. And she cannot be used to the stage to present an open invitation to the dialogue channel. And they also reflect what the dialogue is in this.
Sir, thank you, sir. May I kindly request uh, Mr. Richie Hindi and the team Mumbai to come to the stage? Please, Mumbai. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you. The road was a good number of the time. for the president of the Once again, I extend my heart and thank you to each and every one. Thank you. We meet outside for the questions and then we officially for much. Thank you. 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 